Hey there, welcome to The Breakthrough Creative. I am your host, John McDavitt, and this is the place where we talk about, you know it, the business of art and the art of business. Today's episode is the mural episode. I'm so excited because I kind of cut my teeth on murals from middle school on. I like working on a big blank wall or a big blank area. It's very exciting to me. And uh, it is uh, something that usually is uh, a centerpiece of a room, right? It's an exciting, uh, unusual form of art. Not that we don't see murals in places, but it's unusual for uh, the people or the organizations that commission them because it means, hey, we're spending some money, we're spending some time. I hope they're spending money. And and it's going to be a centerpiece to the the room uh, in which it is painted, the room that it graces. And uh, I, for this episode, have a number of photos that I'm going to bring you through my whole process, uh, the creative process, the execution of the mural, the actual painting of it, that process. And I'll have some stories about the actual business aspect of it as well. So if you're listening on the podcast, uh, this may be an episode where you want to go to the YouTube channel, the Breakthrough Creative YouTube channel, and uh, follow along visually. But I'm going to do my best to explain uh, what we're looking at here as we go through. So uh, here we go. Um, in 2015... I was contacted by the Downers Grove Library, and obviously it's a um, public organization, right? A non-for-profit, and I had a relationship with them uh, creating murals in the past. So they did the, 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 the they did this big um, uh, uh, remodeling. I mean, they basically added another half of the building onto their existing building. And they wanted to really uh, upgrade their junior room, which is their kind of toddler through eighth grade area for, for youngsters. And uh, they had, I don't know, I think I, think I, I bid on, I won the whole job, which was huge. And it was about 100 feet of mural and nine feet high. And there were three different areas. So one area, the, the majority of it was this garden wall. And then there was a solar system. And then there was uh, this kind of story time, Miss Mouse's house. And it took me seven weeks to paint it all. I only took two days off over that time. So it was intense. And it was a nice bedrock moment in my young career. And two years later, I believe it was two years, they called me back and had me uh, bid on and then finally commissioned me to, um, I think that was actually just a commission. They were so uh, pleased with the first series of murals I had done and we had such a good relationship. They just said, hey, what would it cost to do this? So they commissioned me to paint this 30 foot by four foot mural that was about 12 feet off the ground. So that was interesting because it was up high and uh, that was a blast. And then, you know, fast forward about 12 years, 14 years after I started the first mural and they had a new director in and apparently he wanted to remake the whole place over in a more modern image. So all the murals went, they, they redesigned the place at least uh, the, the face of it, and all the murals were gone. And it was a real shame uh, just because, you know, we couldn't save any of those murals or take them down. They weren't on canvas. They were painted right onto the wall and the substrate. So it was uh, a little disappointing, but I got photos of everything, which was great. And, you know, things have their season. And so that, that was exactly what I looked at, that whole... Um, era of my mural work as it was like okay it was a season it was fun it served its time and purpose and and that's great well three years later uh, I get a, a call from the library and they tell me hey we have 
uh, some grant money and we would like, or that, I guess they had money in the coffers for art and we would like to work on a mural uh, and we'd like you to do it. And will you come in and meet with us? Well, yeah, of course I'm going to go in and meet with them. So it was this 10 by eight foot area. And uh, I went in and I, I met with somebody I'd worked with on the prior two mural projects that I had completed with them. And then they uh, had some new people there. So we sat down and they had no idea what they wanted. They knew where they wanted it to go. It was going to go on this curved wall. And I'll show you that photo in a minute. But we started just sitting in a room with some eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper talking through ideas. And the parameters were this mural needed to um, be suitable and attractive to toddlers through eighth grade. Well, that's a pretty broad age span, right? I, I mean, what is going to be cool to a toddler or freak out a toddler is probably different than what's going to be cool to an eighth grader or turn off an eighth grader. So I needed to come up with some kind of an image that uh, had a lot of life to it, a lot of interest. It had to tie in to uh, a broad range of age and diversity. And and I thought, okay, this this is cool. Like I I can I can have a lot of different elements in this mural, and I wonder. It, it, what's the best way to do it? Like I needed, I needed a concept that would allow me to put in anything I wanted. So um, I thought, what if we had books that were just kind of flying out of the library and uh, the photos were coming to life, the content inside the books was coming to life. And they loved that idea. And I'm going to bring you over to my first image now. Oh, yeah. and uh, this is the very first sketch that I created. Um, I guess I should say complete sketch. I think I had like a, a chicken scratch set of sketches on eight and a half by 11 paper. And uh, it, it was reflective of what you're seeing here. And then when I created this, I went back um, home and I, I considered what other elements could go in here. And... This dinosaur you see, the T-Rex with the goggles coming out of the book, he was, I think, the very first character that I designed, the very first element, and he never really changed. There were a couple of little characters we added to go around him, but th they loved the concept. The concept just suited them to a T. And because I had done this uh, mural, the, the one that I said was 30 foot by four foot high. It was really a scene of Downers Grove, downtown Downers Grove. They had like this train track that ran along it. And so they had these uh, oversized train cars, electric trains that would run back and forth. That was pretty cool. And, you know, at one end of the train track, I had one city and at the other end I had Chicago uh, because there was a, a train that ran from the city out to, uh, I think it was Aurora, and it was kind of a nice capper on either end of that mural. Now, that they because I had done that, I thought, oh, it'd be cool to do another cityscape, so I included the cityscape down there. I don't even know if we talked about that when, when I went back in. I think they just liked the idea of it. And because it was going onto this curved wall, I, I didn't know exactly what it would look like, but I knew I needed to... Um, create something that was dynamic. I wanted it to be dynamic. So I didn't want to just do like a straight on horizon. I wanted to curve it a little bit. And that would give me a vanishing point in the lower left-hand corner. And this thing had a load of vanishing points, but it was exciting. So so from here, uh, once, once this got approval and um, I had them sign off every step of the way, this is what I do with my mural clients. Like, hey, do you like this? Great. Will you sign off on it? And they sign it and then and then you know it's not hard and fast that I won't make changes but what it, what it says is is we like this concept we want to move forward with this and then if they come in and scrap it entirely and we start new then we're probably gonna to need to talk a little bit more about price and and all that and so that never happened with this client and I, I've always been uh, really comfortable with them and we had a, a good working relationship we did sign a contract. 
I encourage you to, to have something in writing with uh, any client that you're working with, particularly around murals, because you want to work out the terms. How are you going to get paid? I mean, for me, I got half up front and then half upon completion. And if you get half up front, you've got your materials covered. I was not worried at all about receiving the balance of my payment. Um, but, you, you know, I have an episode talking about a difficult client and I, it was another mural that I had done for another company. And you'll hear some of the horror story of that where they didn't, they agreed to pay half up front and they signed a contract, but they didn't do it for a while. I had to really push it with them to, to uh, or hold my ground with them to get the money up front. So yeah, that wasn't a worry with the library, um, but you still want to have something in writing. And it's good for both of you. And I encourage you, I'm not a lawyer, right? So if, if you really want to feel comfortable, get legal involved because it's a whole different language and there are things that a lawyer may see that um, you're not going to or probably will see that you're not going to and they're there to protect you. So it's not cheap. It's not for the faint of heart, but, you know, you've got to, you've got to be wise and you've got to determine, you know, what do you want to do? Uh, I don't always use uh, legal counsel when I'm looking over a contract or writing a contract for a project like this. Um, but, you know, it's something you may want to consider. And then, like I said, with the terms, you really want to get half up front. And then you want to know, what's the deadline? When do you want this done by? Because they may look at you and say, well, a week. And you're going to be like, a week for an 8 by 10 foot mural with all this work going on inside of it? I don't know about that. That's, that, that's not realistic. And they may not know. So you've got to educate your client in, in the process and what it takes to do it. And you'll see some of that in uh, this episode as well as we continue on. So we, uh, we made our agreement. I knew that I had two months from the time that I started. And um, so my next step on this one here was to, to go from the sketch to color. And you're gonna see some of the elef ele elephants. Some of the elements are different now. Um, you know, I, I got rid of the shuttle, I got rid of the whale, I got rid of uh, the girl on the book. And, um, you know, they talked about what if, what if we have like some storybook stuff, we have science, we have math. Like they wanted to cover um, uh, uh, like every kind of topic that you might go to the library for. Uh, technology and, and on and on and so in this color rendering you can see I've got a knight coming out of the book so that's kind of fantasy there's some history elements in there you've got this octopus and um, a dolphin and so you're getting some nature covered I've got the bear down here with a storybook over his head and some butterflies and then I have this T-Rex that has these goggles. And he's he's now starting to form into, you know, more of a, a storybook character, a fantasy character. But he's also got this element of uh, um, steampunk to him. And that never left him either. Why did I put that in there? I don't know. It just, I just felt it and it looked good and that they were happy with it. And so then I have all of these books trailing down and, and they're coming out of the library. So I had this kind of three-quarter view of the library. And it's very, you know, a simple rendering, but it has the elements, the architectural elements of the library that make it recognizable. And then there's the city of Chicago way off in the background. And I've got my moon up there as well. I gave him a smiley face. And then, you know, it, it was just a lot of fun. You can see that uh, this was done in January of 2017 after everything was uh, agreed upon as far as moving ahead with the project. And, you know, with this project, I may, I don't even think that I had the money up front or we had terms. I think we had a vague idea, but I had such a good relationship with them. I just moved forward with it. I felt comfortable. So I don't do that all the time, but I did it here. All right. The next rendering is the next version of this. You can see there's a lot more going on now. Now I've got this kind of a steampunk uh, rocket all the way on the left, shooting out of a book, heading toward the moon. I've got this beanstalk that is starting to frame the left side 
of the mural, top to bottom. I like to frame my murals. I like things to get big and, and to give me perspective where, where things are coming out at us and pushing back. You can see that the, the girl from the initial sketch who was sitting on, on the book has now become this uh, ballerina uh, violinist and she's, she's kind of embodying the art of the whole thing. And then the butterflies here the, were changed to monarchs. You can see in the first concept they were multicolored fantasy looking and now they're monarch butterflies and that was because uh, they they would actually I forgot what they called it they would they were called like a, a rest stop or a, 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 a station. I think they were a monarch butterfly station and these butterflies would come and they would lay their eggs on um, a specific kind of, uh, I think it was milkweed or something, I don't remember, but they would lay their eggs there and then, you know, it was just a, a, a cool thing that, that happened to be a part of the library. And so we worked those into the mural. You can see I have these three shapes down here. They're the three little pigs and they actually never, never came into it. They, they went away and I have an atom down here, so we've got science. Up uh, on top of the night now, I've got these math books that are spitting out numbers and uh, geometric shapes. And then um, the bear down here is still holding the storybook over his head. And this got greenlit. And when that got greenlit, um, I took it to this next stage, which is I took a photo of the wall. Now you can see the curve on the wall. You can see what I was dealing with. And uh, I took my concept rendering and I imported it into Photoshop. I took a photo of this program room wall, the curve uh, on it, and I put that into Photoshop. And then I transformed as a top layer my concept art to follow the curve of the wall. I even added this highlight on the front down the middle of it. And it really helped my client to be able to see, oh, this is what we're paying for. This is what we're getting. You're going to find as a visual artist that um, many, many people can't see what we can see in our heads. And it's our job to convince them that what they're going to be getting is, is good. And it's, it's part of uh, the whole process is to make your client, in my estimation, feel comfortable that they're going to be comfortable walking through this whole process because people don't understand artists. They don't understand, and by and large, the process. And we might as well be magicians to them. It's like magic. They, they just can't comprehend. And they think it's a talent that we're born with. And if you've heard me before, you know I'm kind of, I, I go this way and that way on, on talent. I think talent is a, a thing. I don't know how much of a thing it is because I couldn't paint like this or create like this when I was five. It just wasn't in me. It was something I had to cultivate. So I think we've got to cultivate that. And in turn, um, we, we need to cultivate our business skills to be able, and our communication skills to be able to uh, explain and, and uh, uh, persuade and help clients to understand what it is that we're doing. Because they're relying on us, right? They're relying on us to, to uh, complete this whole vision. All right. So once that was approved, I took, again, this color rendering that I had created for them, and I turned it to black and white. And then I added a grid all around it. So this thing was 10 feet wide by... Uh, eight feet high, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven and a half feet high. And uh, so I created this grid and you can see that I numbered it left to right, one to 10. It's almost like the game Battleship, right? Hey, seven C, what's that? I can now go to that square and I can see, oh, it's got part of the violin in it, part of the musical notes uh, from the violin part of the T-Rex's book. So I know where that's going to go on the wall once I put these squares up on the wall, okay? So I had this with me the whole time. I had this tool with me. 
And I made it black and white because I wanted to be able to see my values as well. So your values are how dark something is and how light something is. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So here's the actual wall. What is this? These are, these are little drawings I'm going to get rid of. All right, so... All right, so what is this? So this is, this is the wall. If you look closely, you can see I've painted it white, okay? Some of the blue of the background is showing through, but I've painted it white, and I've, I've put my grids up there. And how I did that was I, I have this uh, transparent ruler, and it's 18 inches, and it's 18 inches long and 2 inches wide. And it, it shows all the demarcations through the transparencies. So I could tell where every inch was, and I can also um, put this across a marker. Like if I put two marks, you know, 12 inches across, and, and you know, one is, one is higher than the other, then if I flip this uh, ruler, I can draw straight down, and I should have a straight line or a really close to straight, straight line. So I worked all the way across this mural, and I got to tell you, at this point, whenever I start a big mural like this, I'm intimidated. Like, I really feel the pressure of, oh, my goodness, this thing is bigger than me. And I've done this before. So I, I just put it out there to let you know what I'm feeling. Maybe it's an encouragement to you. Maybe you think I'm crazy. That's okay. I, I like it when I feel, you know, kind of the pressure of something big because it means it's important. And it's important to me and it's important to the client and and it's like, wow, okay, I, I, I've got to focus on this. So once I got all the squares on the grid and it corresponded back to my original drawing, then I carried on. And this was the beginning where I started to pencil sketch in detail these characters onto the wall. And I hadn't ever sketched a mural with this kind of detail before, but... But this is exactly how I approached this one, and I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you can see the moon, and, and I'm, I'm getting a lot of detail in there. And it was also something that the client, as the client walked by, if there was something they, they really didn't like, they could let me know. Like, I would see it in their faces, or I could ask them about it, or they would flat out tell me. And again, they're, they're minor adjustments, and it's just a good relationship with you and your client to be able to do that. Like, say I really like this moon, and they said, well, his smile looks like the Joker. That doesn't look friendly. I don't think kids will like it. Then I would ask them, do you, do you want me to make a change? They'd probably say yes. And then on, on paper, I would work on um, softening the design or trying to satisfy their vision. And I, I'm completely fine with that, generally, if somebody's reasonable. It's not a big deal for me because they've got to live with it. And I've got to live with how they feel about me. So there was the moon. And, um, you know, I was working the bear in. Somehow I ended up painting the bear a little bit in there. I think he, he extended maybe beyond where I, I thought I was going to finish the mural. And they had asked me to carry over a little bit. Um, and you can see I've got the rocket over here. And I added a little kind of an astronaut character. And... You can see some of the vine, and I had this ant on the vine who I don't know if he survived in or not. Uh, the, the sketch stage, he may he may not have. Um, Jack and the Beanstalk, I, I had um, the book with the giant in perspective kind of coming out of the book, and the Beanstalk is coming out of the book, and Jack is getting away with the golden goose as he climbs up the, uh, the vine, and... Uh, there's a real close-up so you can see all the detail of not just the pencil, but the detail of the paint. You can see all the brush strokes in the paint. And uh, th these were fun photos to take. I really enjoyed this part of the process. Um, here's our knight, and the knight's coming out of the book. And I thought, well, if he's coming out of the book, maybe I'll have the top of a turret coming out of the book. You can see the octopus is now holding on to him. And I have the dragon coming to life off of some of the elements in the book. And then there's a, a detail of the night. And here's a, a look at the city. 
and you can see all the detail that went into that. I am not a cityscape painter guy, so this was a, a bit intimidating to me, but you know, I just kind of followed the rules. You can see some things are off a little bit as far as perspective, but I, I fixed them later. And then here is our ballerina, um, violinist lady, and I added a little bird to the end of her bow. And I have a composer coming out of the book below her. And then there's all these notes that are going to be winding uh, out through the air around her on, on their... Um, I always forget it. What do you call it? I always forget. The, the notes go on to um, a measure. It's a bunch of measures, I guess, flying out of the book. And then uh, there's some detail on the dolphin and the octopus. And I decided to make the octopus an artist. He was going to be helping to paint. And I love octopus. I, I don't know what it is about them. They're just so cool and so alien and so smart. I, I wanted to add an octopus in there, and so I did. And then here are de details on the Tyrannosaurus Rex flying out of the book. And you can see uh, the goggles got really, really steampunk and are deco-ish. Those were a lot of fun. And uh, then some detail on the characters coming out of the book. I know cavemen didn't exist around the time of dinosaurs, or maybe they did, who knows. But I've got this uh, brachiosaur coming out of the book, and this uh, caveman is like, mm, that's going to be lunch. And then a final shot of the mural at large. So, And so we move from our drawing to some color. Funny, I was doing this underpainting and using a Tuscany reddish, brownish color. And somebody asked me in the middle of all of this underpainting I was doing uh, when I was going to start using color. And I, I told her, well, I, red's a color or brown's a color, whatever I said. And they did not seem to be too amused by my response. So why am I using brown? Well, I'm doing an underpainting. And by underpainting, I mean I, it's really a value study. I want to see where my lights are, where my darks are, and I want to have a good idea of this before I start trying to get into color, um, full color, because it, you can have issues where things just start to go too flat or they're too harsh. And so I made my way around and uh, painted in what I thought everything might look like in quote-unquote black and white or tonal, a tonal value study. And it was interesting because I, because when I, when, the way the scheduling worked out, I was hoping that I could seal the pencil lead, but it did not work out well. And by that, I mean, I was going to have to spray a fixative onto the wall and that stuff smells and everybody was already a little up in arms about, um, you know, some of the, the smells from the, the paints that I was going to be using. So I just said, whatever, I'll just, uh, and, and I don't blame them. They've got customers who are coming in, right? People who are coming to the library. And you don't want to scare anybody away. You want it to be useful for everyone. And because I was painting live, um, it just made sense that I'm not going to rock the boat on that. I'll just deal with the, the pencil lead bleeding into the underpainting. And I'm getting my darkest darks in over here. And you can see the next round, um, darkest darks and still making my way over, working on the folds of our ballerina's dress, um, adding more stuff to the vines, kind of flat in here, but I'm working it out. I was so sorry to see the drawing go away. I really enjoyed that part of it. Uh, and you can see yet a little bit further, right, from that last one, working on the buildings, mixing white in here and there to get a lighter tone, and then uh, making my way around the corner and uh, starting to work on the bear and, and everybody. And then uh, I was going to move into colors. So these are the paints I used. I used Home Depot... Uh, bare latex flat wall paint. 
I went in with my Pantone colors and I knew that I wanted uh, a cerulean blue or cobalty cerulean blue. I wanted an ultramarine blue, a cadmium red, a cadmium yellow. I picked out a green just in case. I wanted something a little bright that I wouldn't be able to mix with these other colors. Uh, the red, brown red here, Tuscany red that I used was really my, um, oh, uh, raw sienna. And then I had, what color is this here? This is a, now it's jet black. I didn't end up using any black in the mural because black can deaden the life of color. So I thought, all right, but I had a jet black there. And then these are the brushes I used. I had a few other brushes, but you know, these are pretty typical artist brushes. And then these are more like house painting, wall painting, painter brushes. And then I started to drop in some colors uh, to make the outer space or the sky look deeper. I needed to add blues. And so I had my cobalty cerulean blue and uh, an ultramarine that I was working in over the brown. I started to lay in uh, some some tones over, like highlights, I guess, over my dragon, my dragon. Uh, I started to add some highlights in over my dinosaur there. And you can see I'm working out the texture of the creature's skin, even as I'm I'm working out the colors. Now, I wanted to check and see my values. So I would stand back a little bit and take a photo with my phone. And then I would duplicate that photo in my phone and I would make it into black and white. And I'd be able to see what my values truly were. And you can see I'm running into a little bit of flatness here between the ballerina and the blue. And... Let's see here. Then I continued to add in my yellows and reds in the sky. He had a very rainbow kind of an effect going with the sun that was setting. And I decided that all of my highlights were going to come from the right side of the mural. And all of my moon highlights, the, the moon is lighting this side of it. Uh, are going to be cool. And you'll see that progress as we move forward into uh, the timeline here. And, you know, you can see, again, I'm really working out the background and the characters are kind of cutouts at this point. And here we are looking at some of the color work that I'm doing over the city and I'm able to straighten out some of my, my bad perspective here and there as I'm moving through coloring, massaging it closer, closer, closer to where it's gonna go. You can see more of those yellow highlights being added now, on, again, on, on the right side of every character. And, and then I started to add some rich hues into uh, some of the different elements. So I'm adding my greens into my vine or beanstalk. I'm adding my bright red orange onto the octopus. Uh, this, this dress is going to end up being a purplish dress. So I'm just working it all in. You can see that I'm starting to add color to the book. I'm working on the color uh, in the picture in the book where the turret is coming out from the castle and I'm avoiding as much as I can the night because <laughs> I didn't know exactly what to do with them. And here you can see some of the developmental process between Jack and the goose on this side and Jack and the goose over here to the right. More colors. And, and there's a stage in between your drawing and even your underpainting and, and your finish, your final. And it's just, it can be such an ugly, discouraging stage. 
and you have to work through it. I, I've never been on a project yet where I just haven't had this <clears throat> very ugly stage and it's just part of the deal. So you've got to get your mural through this stage or any piece that you're working on. And so here again, we have some value studies. Uh, I was I was concerned as I stood back that this wasn't popping. So I took a look in black and white and sure enough, the green and the blue are, are about the same value and the brown, everything's the same value. So I needed to work on that to make it pop some. And here you can see, oh, by the way, I had these, these solo cups are just so easy to work with. You can mix into them. You can take little bits of paint. You don't have to have the quart with you the whole time. And by the way, that's all I bought were quarts. The quarts worked for the whole mural and covered everything. I don't think I had to buy any additional quarts. And uh, you can see my little palette down here that I use, and I would clean that out at the end of every day. I had a little cart, like a book cart, that they had at the library that I would put all my stuff on, and I would just push it toward the back, and it would store in a little side room out of everybody's way. So that was very convenient. But, you know, I'm able to look in this picture now, if we're going back to the values, the values of... The city uh, are fairly even, but it looks like it's further back, right? I was going to add a little bit of, um, uh, what do you call it, haze, so that you can, like the environment, the air quality, <laughs> speaking of a city, gets pushed back a little bit. Things tend to look more blue, gray. And then uh, I have it flipped on this one, but you can now see some of the highlights in our ballerina violinist's dress and you know again it's a great tool I, I recommend you use it if uh, you are ever working on a large project now we're getting to more of a final here I mean this is very final this is the final night and the final book and all the details are played out and you know, it took quite a while to get to this point. I mean, it was a two-month mural, and I was there probably, I would do four-hour sessions, three to four-hour sessions, and I might spend some real time sitting just looking at it, just just trying to determine am I happy with how, how it's coming along. And you can see that we decided the night his hand and his shoe boot armor would break the border at the top of the mural and uh, here's our dragon again you know pulling out the details putting some highlights onto the page to give it a nice rippled look and you know it was really delightful just to be out in the public painting this and for them to see the process and progress and uh, I really like connecting with people, so that's that's fun. It can be distracting at times, but it's a good distraction. Uh, people don't get to be around artists very often, and I don't think artists get to be around the public while they're working very often. So it was uh, just a, a blast to be able to visit with people and answer their questions. And you can see our, our progress here on our ballerina. She, uh, she was a little rough looking in the face early, and I... I kind of left it like that just because it was a point of interest to people they they would it was interesting to see their reactions because they they were always wondering is it done is it done is that it mm. and you know obviously she wasn't I wanted to to uh, get away from a cartoonier look and um, have something a little bit more delicate in the end and you can see the dress coming along. I had all this blue underneath. I did buy a separate purple. That was one color that I was struggling with the limited palette I was working with uh, of the other quart colors. I bought a purple and was and dabbed a little bit of that on. And then I decided, you know, to have this pink at the bottom. The pink tights just um, made it all flow a little bit more nicely. And... We come over here to our rocket ship, our old-timey rocket ship. And uh, this this was just really fun to play with all the colors and to have this light source 
at the bottom really popping out and over and impact, even though it probably wouldn't really impact the, the undersides of these pipes, it, it gave us a dramatic fill. And then my son was pretty young at the time, so I did a little likeness of him in this mural. And come over here, we can see our, our dolphin, and I, I painted a reflection of the rainbow in the mural into this wave that the dolphin and the octopus are riding. And I'd given the octopus a little uh, Scottish cap. Uh, I am Scottish, so that was fun. And then there's a, a paint bucket here that the octopus is pulling. That's um, it's a little flat when I look at it. It doesn't jump out as a paint bucket. So that's, that's interesting. I wonder how it'll look in person when I go back. And then, of course, there's an addition of all these books in the background. There's the conductor for the ballerina. And we come over here to our final dinosaur. I really had a good time with the scales and the textures on his face and all the writing on the pages, which is just gibberish. I just faked all that in. Um, and then, you know, I'm sure that, again, dinosaurs and cavemen did not roam together, but it was fun to work these guys out and to really give him an edge coming after this brachiosaur. But I love how kind of uh, uh, ig ignorance is bliss fully looking on at, at us. And then that finalizes here. This was pretty much it. I had a, a final coat. I think I did a little bit more work on the vine. We added the vine all the way up and above. It just seemed like it would be a nice addition. And then my friend Chris came in and helped me to finish off the side. They added this wall at the end and it was so simple to add the colors that we just did it and it was fine. And then um, I did a clear coat over it after it sat for a couple of days. And I think the, the clear coat that I used was, um, it was a flat, a matte finish. Uh, Modern Masters was the, yeah, the, the sealer that I used, the varnish, the final coat to protect it from uh, greasy little fingers and anything else that might, you know, try to wreck it. If somebody goes at it with a hammer, not much I can do, but uh, there you have it. So that was the mural process. Uh, we had a, a, a ribbon cutting, which was really nice and an unveiling of it. And uh, some of the local politicians were there. All my friends were there. And it was just a, a, a fun piece to um, create and execute for a client who has just been such a, a fantastic, fantastic um, uh, patron of mine over the years. And, you know, it can be a little daunting getting into mural work, uh, but once you're in the middle of it, it's still daunting. <laughs> and at some point you just go, okay, I'll get this finished soon. I'm just going to put my head down and keep going. It's like any project, you know, one bite at a time, you, you rake one leaf at a time and you'll eventually begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, you just keep working until it's done. You work until there's no more work to do or you work until there's no more time left. And my client was very pleased with it. Uh, felt like I had a lot of clients there, which is good because there, there are a lot of librarians and administrators there. And it, it was just a delightful experience. And so that's it. That's the mural process. That is the business of the mural. And, you know, I encourage you, if you're going to do a project like this, the, the steps that I take are, are pretty solid steps. Uh, designing it with the client, getting their feedback, getting sketches done, getting approvals on those sketches, going to some color renderings, getting approval on those color renderings, have them sign the sheets. And then, you know, b before all that or right around that point, you want to have the terms of agreement written out. How long it's going to take, uh, when it needs to be done by, uh, how much it's going to cost, and how the payments are going to be made. 
and um, you know, and then along the way, you may have some suggestions that come in or requests. And, you know, I'd encourage you if it's a substantial change, you need to have that written in your agreement somewhere that, you know, every step of the way, you're going to sign off on the design. And, and if there are radical changes or major changes, there may be an additional fee. And, you know, keep it cool if somebody, if somebody upsets you, which I did not experience on this, if, but if somebody were to upset you and say, oh, this is awful, we need to change 75% of this, don't lose your cool. It's hard to see uh, what's going on in the moment to have that perspective. So just gather yourself and you can ask, oh, wow, what's wrong? And, and hear them and listen. And then if you don't know what the answer is, you can just say, hey, can I have some time to think about this? Let me, let me sit for a minute. And, and then you can decide if you're ready to give an answer or if you need a day or two to, to uh, figure out what it is that you need to do. But, you know, it's, uh, it's just a process and you figure it out as you go. So thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. Man, I don't know how good this is going to be as a podcast, but you hopefully, uh, if it's bad, you caught on and you, you've switched over to YouTube, to the Breakthrough Creative channel to watch uh, this breakdown occur as opposed to trying to imagine the whole thing. So with that being said, I'm John McDavid. I am your host of The Breakthrough Creative. And uh, I thank you for being with me through an absolutely delightful project that, that I just loved and uh, got, got paid well for. So I'll see you next time. Cheers.